Wounds in His Grip with Dr. Chuck Betters of Mark Inc. Ministries. Today we continue with the message from our archives titled, The Crown of Suffering, from the series, Unveiling and Understanding Revelation. Each In His Grip message is designed to help turn your heart towards Jesus and to equip you to walk by faith. Let's join Dr. Betters in the sanctuary. He says, you are rich. You're rich in the treasures and the blessings of grace. You're rich in the knowledge of the truth. You're rich and you have a strong spiritual life in the midst of severe affliction. They had not left their first love as did the Ephesians. There was no cool down in the second generation. Instead, tribulation drove them to Christ. Their members were prepared to give ample testimony from firsthand experience of the knowledge of the truth that God is faithful. Even though they were deprived by the world, even though they were poor and miserable from a temporal point of view, yet they were fully protected by and in love with the king of the universe and they knew it. You study the history of the church, history proves, history proves that the richer the church is, the poorer the church becomes. The more we have, the more pitiable our witness becomes. But the church is never so nearly perfect as when she is suffering and called upon to fight the battles of faith and to suffer and endure affliction for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Why? Because during times like that, we have no confidence in the flesh. We have no strength of our own. We are driven to him because we are out of resources. We have no strength. We have no faith. We have no hope apart from Christ. And he uses those afflictions to drive us to himself so that we may know fully that all that we are or ever hope to be rest in him. The stronger and the more conscious this faith is, the more the church will grow and increase in spiritual riches. That's a principle that all of history bears out. He promises them in verse 11 a crown of life. Not the royal crown, diadem, that's not the word used. It's the laurel, the wreath that's given to the victor. It was worn by the magistrates when they faithfully completed their political term. It was worn at banquets and festive events. It was even worn at the heathen worship services to show that their life belonged to the gods. The crown that God gives to the afflicted Christian is the crown of glory, the crown of suffering, that belongs to those who belong to him. He says, you will not be hurt at all by the second death, a reference to the judgment. You see, John sees permanence and stability and life maintaining itself in spite of the invasion of even death. You will not be touched by the second death. When you look at Ephesus, it was the city of changing commitments, changing values, losing their first love. But when you come to Smyrna, you see even in the city the unchanging properties of the hills and the plains and the lands and the seas. And in that church that indwelt that city, a continuity that existed beyond the grave, a continuum, if you will, from death to life, unwavering. And yet, friends, we must address the problem of pain. We have to ask the question, why? Why, why, why is there suffering? A little baby dies without any warning. Why? A godly woman is diagnosed with AIDS through no fault of her own. A young woman is murdered, 
by her ex-boyfriend. A young father is shot to death by a thief at point-blank range. A vibrant, powerful pastor who had preached the gospel and established great works saw many churches planted as taken by cancer at the age of 40. Why? A young woman in her 20s finally admits that she had been repeatedly raped by her own father. Why? These are not just stories, friends. These are actual experiences of pain that I as a pastor have had to minister to people in. And the list is endless. And the questions are the same. Why? Why do we lose a loved one? Why can I not have children when down the block this woman who, who can't control herself has five and ten children? Why? These are good questions. Consider John and Betty Stram, a young couple that had prepared themselves for the mission field, excited about the call that God had given them to China, went to language school, got the education, raised the support. The doors were wide open to this couple young and excited about the Lord Jesus Christ, they march into the chambers of China, carrying with them their little newborn, their pride and their joy. God had apparently opened the door of ministry, and there, after long preparation, they stood ready to minister. Suddenly, their door is broken in. And a bunch of teenage communists hail them away, even leaving the baby behind on the bed in the little snuggle bunny. And there for a night they were imprisoned. In the morning, they would be ripped away from that child, taken by these teenage communists down the block, and their necks would be laid bare, and within a few seconds, their heads would be on the ground. Why? On the eve of that beheading, this is what she wrote. Afraid? Of what? To feel the Spirit's glad release? To pass from pain to perfect peace? The strife and strain of life to cease? Afraid of that? Afraid of what? Afraid to see the Savior's face, to hear his welcome, and to trace the glorious gleam from the wounds of grace. Afraid of that? Afraid of what? A flash, a crash, a pierced heart, darkness, light, O oh, heaven's art, a wound of his counterpart. Afraid of that? Afraid of what? To do by death what life could not, baptize with blood a stony plot, till souls shall blossom from the spot. Afraid of what? Could we write something like that? What an incredible spirit. And yet you look at it and you say, why? What a waste. Affliction in the world has a cause and an effect. A fierce, invisible war rages, and that is often why we don't receive the answers to the questions that we ask. We don't know. We cannot see what is going on behind the scenes. From before the foundation of the world, before God created the heavens and the earth, there was an invisible war raging between the force of Christ and the force of Satan. Even in Revelation 12, 11, Satan's design is exposed where he is using the effect of our fall into sin to separate us through death from the love of Christ. Death, the enemy of man. 
And ultimately, friends, no matter how many questions we ask, it comes down on this fact. There is a war that is raging. There is a battle that is being fought. It is the battle between Christ and Satan. And guess where the battlefield is? My heart and your heart. That's where the war is raging. And ultimately, when we start asking questions like why, we have to come down in faith and say at that point, the war is raging and I am the battleground. Take a message from Stephen and from Paul. Have you ever met Job's comforters? You know why you're in the trouble that you're in, they say? It's because you've got some sin in your life, and in some cases that's true. Job's comforters always have the answers as to why you're experiencing the pain you're experiencing, why you're suffering the way you're suffering, why you're going through what you're going through. Job's comforters are always there. They're right around the corner. You don't have to read the book of Job to meet Job's friends. They're always there. They're right around the corner. When you come to Stephen in the New Testament, Acts chapter 6 tells us that the church sought out from itself deacons who would minister to the needs of the people. And they found one, Stephen, who was a man that was characterized as one with great wisdom. He was a powerful preacher. He was able to preach so much Scripture and with such conviction that the Bible says he gave as a bird's eye view the history of Israel in one message and the people were cut to the quick. A man who was incisive in the Scriptures, loved people, ministered to people, preached the gospel with precision and accuracy. And when Acts rolls around and we read in that book, all of a sudden this man, Stephen, who appears on the pages of the New Testament, just as quickly disappears. There he is before his enemies. What are they going to do to him? They're going to kill him. They're going to stone him. Why didn't his faith turn those stones into pebbles? Harmless pebbles? Instead, one rock after another would hit him. His body would begin to swell as down into that pit, boulder after boulder was thrown at him, rock after rock, ripping open his body, a most horrible death one could imagine. Why? What a waste it seems. At least from the perspective of his mother or his brother's or his sons or his daughters, I am sure they must have sat there and said, why, God, is this happening? And yet when you read just a couple of chapters later, Acts chapter 8, verse 1, it says that one was standing there who was a witness to the whole event, holding the cloak. It says, and Saul, who became Paul, consented to his death. It was Saul who was standing there watching as this man knelt down as the rocks and the boulders were ripping his body apart and prayed this prayer. Listen to what the man said moments before he died. The Bible says he looked up into the heavens and said, Father, lay not this charge to their account. Sounds like his master, doesn't it? Sounds like Jesus on the cross. When he says, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. This man was a Christian. He was like his master and prayed that prayer. And you know, it's interesting. God answered that prayer. Because one standing there on the brow of that hill, looking down into that pit where that man was thrown, heard that prayer. And just a short time later, that same man would go out hauling in Christians to kill them in the name of his God. And suddenly, I believe, suddenly, in response to the prayers of Stephen, God laid bare the heart of the Apostle Paul, brought him on his knees, struck him blind, and 
gloriously and marvelously saved him and took a man of brilliance and majesty and made him an apostle to the Gentiles. No greater Christian has ever lived than the Apostle Paul, in my opinion. Why? The work that Stephen did in his death had a far greater effect upon history than simply a longer life could have given him. And then it's interesting when Paul evaluates the successes of his life. When he comes toward the end of his life and he begins to look back at what made him such a successful Christian. He doesn't talk about his answers to prayer, although he had many. He doesn't talk about the miracles that God worked through him, although he had many. He doesn't talk about the fact that he went on three missionary journeys and planted many, many churches. He doesn't talk about the hundreds and hundreds, maybe even thousands of people who were converted through his preaching. He doesn't catalog or litany for us those kinds of successes. At least from our point of view, that's what we would consider to be a successful Christian. When he comes to the end of his life, do you know what he does? When he looks back and says, here is what made me a success. You can read about it in 2 Corinthians 11. This is what makes me a success. That I was counted worthy to suffer affliction for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then he lists his sufferings. He talks about what he had to endure. He talks about his pain. He talks about his sorrow. When, when Peter and, and the others were imprisoned uh, and they were threatened with their lives and, and with physical torment, they were released from the prison and the Bible says they went out of there rejoicing in that they were considered worthy to suffer for the name of Christ. What a mindset. What made Paul successful? He says, my suffering, the fact that I was considered worthy by God to suffer for him. That's what made me a success. You see the veil that, it, that, that this invisible war, where this invisible war is raging, is dramatically lifted in the book of Job. We see it in its puzzle parts nowhere else in scripture in a better way than the book of Job. Dramatically, it's lifted to show us what's happening behind the scenes. Satan appears before God. Satan goes before God in heaven and gains permission to afflict Job. A man who loved God like no other. Then a deluge of calamity, one in rapid succession. Consider this. Job's sons and his daughters were gathered together at a family dinner party. Imagine you in this situation. The Sabaeans come in and take away all the oxen and asses, killing all the servants except the one who escaped to bring this news to Job. A big chunk of his property is taken in just a few seconds. And while that servant is bringing this tragic news to Job, another servant arrives even before the first one stops speaking. And he tells him of a lightning storm which had struck all of his sheep and killed the servants caring for them, except this one who had come to bring news. And before that second servant got finished talking about the lightning storm, before that bearer could finish his bad news, a third one appears. One of Job's workmen who cared for his camels and told of the sudden appearance of a band of Chaldeans who came in three groups and attacked them, taking away all the camels and killing Job's workmen except the one that was telling the story. And before he finishes, a fourth man comes and says that while they were eating, a terrific wind came and whipped off the walls of the house and all the four corners of the house, and the house collapsed. And Job, all of your kids are dead. Crushed under the walls. Within minutes, everything which Job had to bring him rejoicing in his day-to-day -day work 
and in his day-to-day -day living had been wiped out. Gone were his world's harvests. Gone was his family. Gone was the fruit of his labors of creative work. Then we read that he was struck with the disease of elephantiasis. A horrible disease. And yes, even the faithfulness of his wife who said, Job, why don't you just curse God and die? Let's get it over with. For the next 30 chapters, there is an argument between Job and his friends. And you know what the question is? Why? Now, friends, let's not misunderstand Job. I believe he asked why. His friends had reasons why. And I believe he asked why. And I don't believe it's wrong for us to ask why. And for 30 chapters that goes on. And yet when you come to the 13th chapter, God begins to speak directly to Job. And in the 19th chapter. And when he begins to speak to him, he does not chide him for his sins. But he brings him back to who he is. He brings him back to his creatorship. And he basically says to Job, Job, you must allow God to be God. All the puzzle parts are not in. And the place we need to arrive is where Job arrived when he said, Though he slay me, yet will I praise him. Though he kill me, yet will I praise him. But you see, as you read the book of Job, you come to the 42nd chapter, God brought it all to an end. The affliction was but for a moment. He brought it all to an end. He restored to him all that he had lost. He even gave him other kids, so that now he had kids on earth and kids in heaven. A picture of what awaits the believer. God will bring that suffering to an end. That affliction you're going through is but for a moment. It will come to an end. God promised the Smyrnians. And he promised you. You see, the war is raging. The war is raging between Satan and God. Even when Satan tempted Jesus, the Bible says he took him. He carried him. And he said to Jesus, Satan did, Throw yourself down from this mountain. Isn't it written that he will give his angels charge over you so, that you so that you do not dash your head against the rocks? That was a quotation, by the way, from Psalm 91, 11 and 12. But it's interesting that Satan didn't go further into the scriptures because the next two verses of Psalm 91, God speaks directly to Satan. And he says that that Messiah to come will crush you. Satan is a master of the half-truth, especially when we're being afflicted, especially when we're going through pain and suffering. Satan only gives you his side of the story, his perspective. But he doesn't tell us about the victory that God is going to have and always will have over. there is an affliction in evangelism. People will listen when they hear our praise coming out of the heart of suffering. God can use our suffering to redirect our courses in another direction. He can take us and close a chapter and open a new one as he begins to orchestrate those various puzzle parts and bring it all together. You may never know in this lifetime how God has impacted others through your affliction. You may never know the reasons why that baby was born deformed. You may never know why you go through that depression. You may never know why you lost that job. You may never have the answers to those questions in this life because the war is not being raged in the physical. The war is being raged in the spiritual. When God brings all the puzzle parts in, like Job, we will have to come to the place where we say, though he slay me, yet will I praise him.
We live in a throwaway society. We want to abort our affliction. We don't want the baby, we abort the baby. If it's a bother, if it's a burden, if there's heavy work, if there's hindrance of whatever kind to my freedoms that I enjoy or feel that I am entitled to, get rid of it! I don't have to suffer this way. If I'm in a bad marriage, get out of it. If I have sickly parents, let somebody else take care of them. Just abort it. I want to tell you, as Christians, we are swimming upstream with the thinking that surrounds us. I want to tell you it will get harder and harder to resist the devil. The temptation is to say, why bother? Thank you for listening to In His Grip, a ministry of Mark Inc. We just concluded the message titled, The Crown of Suffering, from the series Unveiling and Understanding Revelation. You can download this sermon at www.markinc.org. At markinc.org, you'll find numerous free resources that offer help and hope to the hurting. You can also safely give online to help keep In His Grip on the air. Thank you in advance for your support.